Hey, good afternoon. This is Jay Frost speaking to you from the Philanthropy Masterminds Series World Headquarters, my office, and welcoming you to another one of these uh, sessions in a series that goes back under different titles to 2016, all thanks to our friends at DonorSearch who provide a platform and in, in fact have provided several platforms over time so we can hang out with good friends and leaders in the field of fundraising and philanthropy. We're doing that again today. So thank you for hanging out with us. If you're wondering why I'm telling you all things you probably know, it's so that people can come into the room with us. So we're giving them a couple minutes to get together and join us for this session. It's also a great opportunity uh, to tell you that you can completely interact with us, although we cannot see you or hear you. This may be Zoom, but it's not a Zoom meeting. So as a Zoom webinar, we do want to encourage you to use two things today. Uh, one, of course, is the chat platform and view that as a place to have a conversation. Um, then there's Q&A. That's a perfect place to store up your questions throughout the presentation so I can share them with our presenter at the conclusion. And then she can answer all of those, uh, assuming we have time. So please do not hesitate to write whatever occurs to you in the way of a question throughout and put that in the Q&A but try to reserve the chat as a place to have a conversation amongst yourselves. And maybe even right now, start us off by just telling us that you're here. We'd love to see that you're here in the room with us, know that you're here, maybe know where you're from, uh, what organization you're with. If you wanna tell us that, all of that would help our, our uh, presenter tremendously. So please do open up the chat, if you will, it's at the bottom of your page and just tell us hi. I'm sure she would love to see that. And as you're doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our presenter to you today. So she'll be reading some of your hellos as I do that. Um, Emily Heck, as I'm sure you know, is our presenter today, and she's going to be presenting a presentation, of course, on this issue of communications and specifically marketing for giving days, which is something that we have been talking about as a community for several years um, and with greater and lesser degrees of success. So she's gonna be sharing some of the successes that she has seen and worked on throughout her career. Um, through the lens of knowing this, how this works, both in educational and non-educational environments. So if you're here from a university or college, or you're here in another kind of organization, I'm sure you'll find plenty to use, but also plenty to discuss. So once again, discuss in the chat and load up those questions in the Q&A. Emily is the owner and founder of Evergreen Strategic Communications. Um, she launched Evergreen back in 2019 with a very specific goal of helping nonprofits and small businesses who may not have the time, resources, or the skill set to grow their organizations through marketing. Um, she started her career at the Crossroads of America Council, which, as you probably know, is Boy Scouts of America, where she led the marketing department for a 36,000 member council. Uh, she joined the staff of Butler prior to that in 2017, uh, their marketing department, where she managed the marketing strategy for the university's advancement division, working also on the Butler Beyond campaign, which was the university's largest comprehensive fundraising effort to that date. Um, and uh, she's both a graduate of Butler and also an MBA from the University of Indianapolis, where she hangs her hat these days. Um, I should mention that while she was uh, over there on the Butler staff, of course, she did work on this giving day. So in addition to the work she's done as counsel, she's seen it live and in action. And so it's really a pleasure to have you here, Emily, to uh, guide us through some of your experience today. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Jay. I am so happy to be with you and everyone else here on this webinar. I, I'm watching the chats come through. Um, there's a lot of great um, interaction. It seems like there are people from all over the country, which I love. So um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm actually going to switch over to a presentation and do a share screen um, that we can um, watch here. Just one moment. All right. So again, um, as Jay said, um, I'm here today to talk about uh, giving days. Giving days is one of um, my favorite things to work on with my clients. Um, I love giving days. They really excite me, and bring me a lot of energy um, because I think it brings a lot of energy to your donor pool. And so I'm very happy to uh, be with you today to talk about that. So like Jay said, just real quick, um, not to regurgitate my bio, but I am Emily Heck. I am based here in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I don't know if there's anyone else here from Indiana, but it is a very gray and cold day 
here. Um, so hopefully we'll have some spring sunshine soon. But I am the owner and founder of Evergreen Strategic Communications. Um, and I started my agency in 2019. At the end of 2019, um, I left my, my position at Butler and, and decided to go out on my own. And then I'm also in my first year, wrapping up my first year as an adjunct ma uh, marketing faculty member at the University of Indianapolis. So as Jay said, I'm, I was the Associate Director of Advancement Marketing um, at Butler University here in Indianapolis. I, I, I don't seem to get far from home. I graduated from Butler, went back to Butler to work. I got my MBA from uh, University of Indianapolis. I'm now back at UND um, working. So I don't seem to get far from home and far from education. Um, and then of course, I started my career actually as a marketing and communications coordinator for the Crossroads of America Council and then worked my way up to be director of marketing and communications. Um, so my Giving Day background, where did it start? I mean, Giving Days are still um, really young in, uh, in the fundraising cycle and the history of that. So um, I actually started with an organization called Brackets for Good um, in Indiana and in Indianapolis. Um, and it was a initiative that was started ironically by two Butler grads that was always focused during March, around March Madness. And they selected 64 nonprofits to compete against each other weekly um, in a fundraising, fundraising competition. So each week we were paired with another nonprofit and we had one week to raise more money than, than that other nonprofit. And it was a lot of fun. Um, I, our, our team, we got to the elite eight um, of the tournament where we were eventually beat by the Humane Society here in town. And they went on to be the actual winner of the entire uh, giving tournament. So at least we lost to the overall winner, which, which was good. And it, it was a great um, brand awareness activity for um, for all these nonprofits. But we raised about $21,000 during that time. That was 2015 timeframe. Um, and then of course, Giving Tuesday's always been on my radar. I remember in 2013, um, I had heard about Giving Tuesday in 2012. That's when it started and heard about it bubbling up. And in November of 2013, I just decided you know, I'll just put some stuff out on social media on this day and see if we can get anything. I don't even think the council had a really good uh, giving platform, online giving platform. Um, and so it was just a very strange interaction. I doubt we raised any dollars at that point, but that was kind of my first taste into giving days. And then, of course, I went on to Butler University, which days giving days are very popular in higher education. Um, not only do they have the giving days, but they're very active on the Giving Tuesday side. And that's where I really learned a lot about giving days and have been able to carry that on now through my work with other nonprofits. So why use a marketing approach for your giving days? Um, this is kind of an odd concept for some people because the fundraising department and the marketing department um, are typically very separate. Um, when I was working at Butler University, I was actually, my position was actually in the marketing department and advancement was my client. And so my job was to bridge the gap between the advancement department and marketing department. So they're not always naturally, uh, marketing and fundraising don't always naturally go together. Um, but for giving days, there definitely is a natural place for marketing and fundraising to work together. And reason being, fundraising has changed. You all know this, I don't have to tell you it. You know, you can't solely rely on those old school tactics on your big donors that are making six figure, seven figure gifts. Um, how people give has changed. You can see in the top right corner, uh, nearly a third of giving occurred on a mobile device in 2021. And I, I want to know also, as I was looking up this data, that percentage had doubled since 2014. So in just a five, six year span, that percentage had grown tremendously. And I think it'll continue to grow. Um, you have an aging donor pool. Like I said, you know, your older donors who are making major gifts. Um, and can really get you to the finish line on your fundraising goals. 
um, they're aging and, and that may not be happening as uh, gener generational wealth is um, being passed down or as the millennial and Gen Z generation is coming up into their own and finding what philanthropy means to them. Um, I mean, for example, 24% of millennial donors have given to a cause after learning about it on so social media, which is great for giving days because if you're doing it right, then they'll see your cause on, on social media and you can secure that gift, secure that new donor and start to work through more of a cultivation or stewardship strategy to keep them uh, retained. And then um, a little bit younger donors are accustomed to mobilizing rapidly to support a cause. I mean, this is where crowd, crowdfunding has come in. We, we see it all the time. You know, if there's a natural disaster, we see a lot of crowdfunding. Um, there was a lot of crowdfunding during the early days of the pandemic. Um, and so younger donors are used to this. They love this. They love the energy around it. They love being a part of this movement, which plays right into why giving days can be so successful for you and so vital as part of your fundraising calendar. And then I also say donor expectations have changed. Um, it's a competitive branding environment. You have to, um, you, you have to have it together when it comes to your branding. Um, there's a place for the little league, you know, give back night at the local restaurant. But if you're a nonprofit, I, I, from what I've experienced, you're expected from a branding standpoint to run with the big dogs, if you will, um, from your branding and look professional, come across professional. Um, it makes you legitimate. It makes you look like a worthy cause. Um, and so you, you've got to, you've got to look the part. And so with all of this, um, activating your marketing te team early allows them to build a holistic strategy that will support your fundraising strategy. So us as marketing professionals, we can support your fundraising strategy and really help boost your, your giving and your donor um, relationships and engagement um, through, through a holistic strategy. So whenever I st start talking about giving days, I always start with the basics and we start on the fundraising side before I can even really start building a marketing strategy. And, and these are the three things that are my three big questions when, when I'm talking to clients is what does your giving platform look like? Is it well-tested? Um, the simpler for the donor, the better. I know we've all heard this, um, but it was interesting in my my early days of giving days in the 2013, 14, 15, online giving was still a very strange concept for a lot of nonprofits, my nonprofit included. I remember talking to the development officer, what do you mean we can't do online gifts? How difficult can it be? Why do we have to collect all this information? And I think a mindset shift has changed since that time, um, but just making sure that it is simple because people don't want to go through a major pledge card process to make a gift on a on a giving day. It needs to be simple. It needs to be quick. Um, I really like for giving days, I really like Give Campus. They have a great platform. I really like Scale Funder, um, which I know a lot of universities and higher education institutions use. Um, so there's a lot out there that you can use. And, and I always encourage nonprofits um, and, and even my educational organizations to find a giving day type template or website to use because it just makes life so much simpler. It's already set up for you. The structure is already set up um, and it's a great, um, great user interface to use. The next thing I, I talk to my clients about is what are your giving opportunities or challenges? And again, the simpler the better. And these are what I'm gonna use as our rallying point. So you can see there on the right-hand side, some challenges. The one in the middle there is one from Butler's um, Giving Day here this past February, but they did a challenge of 100 gifts to the business school's career development fund unlocks $5,000 to the career mentors program. And, and you can see they achieved that goal and had the, that $5,000 unlocked. So. Is there a board member that you can go to and say, can we use your annual gift to as a challenge to for this giving day? You know, a hundred gifts unlocks 
$5,000 or 250 gifts unlocks this. Um, and it, it helps people give, gives them a rallying point um, to, to circle around. And then you, you see the one from Indiana University there on the right. It was just a simple um, giving opportunity. They for their giving days, theirs is coming up here at the end of April, uh, they have several giving opportunities. And so people can rally around the thing that they are most interested in. Um, it's not just giving to a general IU foundation fund. You know, you can give to the um, IU Bloomington Food and Security Fund. You can give to, uh, I mean, there were, I, as I was looking through them, there are tons of funds that you wouldn't even think of um, and so, you know, it gets people excited to support the thing on for that organization that they love um, and gives people a really customized experience, which I which I really like. The one thing that um, another point on giving opportunities. When I started for Brackets for Good, I actually met with a fundraising consultant who had been in Brackets for Good right before us the, the year prior. Ed. He told me, and I, I've carried this on with me ever since, is you have to give people quick opportunities. It can't be this ambiguous, um, just give to this random fund. And so for Brackets for Good for the Boy Scouts, we said give for camp scholarships, um, send kids to camp. Um, the Humane Society was saying, you know, donate X amount of money and it will feed this many dogs this weekend or give this much money and it provides medical treatment for these animals. And so having something tangible that people can really hold on to um, really helps with giving days and it really helps make, make your case because on a giving day, you're, you're moving so quick, you don't have a long cultivation period that you can really talk through your mission and talk through your cause and, and bring those donors along. So you have to have something that's tangible, that's easy for people to digest and easy for them to get behind, like animal medical treatment or sending kids to summer camp or what have you. Um, and then and the last point that I ask about is a donor database. Um, what are our segmenting opportunities? Segmenting is so big on the marketing side. I, I mean, I know segmenting is um, really big with solicitation letters. It, you know, we're, we're segmenting by giving history, whether, you know, last year or, or prior years, but there's a lot of other opportunity that we can do within segmenting that, that may not be thought of on the development side. Um, obviously in higher education, we're segmenting by college. We're segmenting by um, alumni who have stayed near the university and those who have moved across the country. And so being able to segment and having that data available to us to easily segment um, can make a really big difference in how you communicate with, um, with your audiences. So the next phase that we move on, so we get through the basics and then I wanna move on to storytelling. And this is again, nothing new. Storytelling is so important um, when you're cultivating a donor, when you're thanking a donor, um, when you're just trying to communicate with a donor. Um, so just like your end of the year solicitation letter, storytelling matters with giving days. Um, and my rule of thumb is to have three pillar stories that serve as your pillar uh, throughout the day. Um, these are ideally stories that go with your giving opportunities or challenges. So for example, with Brackets for Good with Boy Scouts of America, our stories were about kids going to summer camp um, on scholarships. So we told those stories of you know, kids who would have never been able to go to summer camp without these scholarships and really try to pull at the heartstrings like we always do with these types of uh, campaigns. But if you have those three stories, and you can always have more stories, I've just found three is more of the magic number for, for in my, my past history, but um, it gives you a good base of content. And so you're not sitting there thinking, okay, what do we need to post? Or what do I need to put in the email? You already have a starting point. And then from there, you can build emails, you can build social content, you can go out and get photography, you can go out and get videography. Um, and it, it really gives you a good base. 
the the image on the right, the screenshot on the right is from a campaign that we did on Giving Tuesday in 2020. Um, and this particular client, their Giving Tuesday was about teacher tributes. Um, so it, this was obviously towards the end of 2020 and they recognized um, how much their teachers have done <laughs> over 2020 with virtual learning and, and just the challenges of that. And so they decided to focus um, their Giving Tuesday on raising dollars for their teacher funds. This is a high school here um, in the Indianapolis area. And so we collected a lot of videos of um, alumni actually telling stories about their favorite teachers. And so that's what we use in the content um, and throughout the day through email and social and what have you. So the marketing toolbox, I, I always say um, I have a toolbox and I, I just have to figure out what combinations of tools are going to make this strategy work. So what I've done here is um, I, I've, I have a collection of slides that explain some of my favorite tools in my giving day toolbox. Um, and that's not to say that there's not more tools that can be used or we can get creative in how we use it, but um, these are my favorites. These are the ones I always pull out for every giving day. Um, and so there, um, we'll start here with email. Email is nothing new um, to, for fundraising um, or it shouldn't be anything new. I hope you're, I hope you're um, implementing an email strategy as part of your fundraising. But what I like to do for days of giving um, is I plan for three day, three day of emails plus a thank you email. So use your pillar stories as your email content. You know, if you do a video for each pillar story, then you have, you, uh, you distribute that video, each video in those emails. Um, you, they need to be quick, easy reads. You want to keep the sense of urgency going, update on challenges and the progress of goal. Um, you can see on the right, this is a email screenshot from Butler's Day of Giving. I think this was 2019. Uh, yes, this was 2019. And so this was our 6 a.m. kickoff email. So just a short description of what was going on. Um, our main challenge was right there at the top. And then we had a video that we shared um, for people to, to, to watch, to get excited. And then, of course, our calls to action there at the bottom. Um, and so this wasn't this wasn't the first time that our our donors and our alumni were hearing about giving day of giving. And so we didn't need to go into a lot of explanation because they were very familiar with it. And the reason they were familiar with it is is that point at the bottom there. We I, I try to target starting emails about four weeks out from your um, from your day of giving. And so I'm doing about an email a week and then increasing the frequency um, as, as we lead up. Email is a challenge you have to balance. I'd, I don't like to send more than three emails on the day of because I think you start to get annoying. And the same thing can happen in that lead up. You don't wanna be sending too many because then you'll start to get annoying and then people will be turned off by um, by your efforts. So it's important to find um, a balance because it's really easy. You think, oh, this is great. I'm putting information right in front of my audiences. But as we know, we all get a ton of email each day um, and a lot of it, it is an automatic delete. And so you don't wanna become a nuisance that you um, are also an automatic delete. And then in that, um, that bullet point, the fourth one down, what I also like to do with email um, and make sure not to overlook is to provide email scripts for your staff or your day of giving ambassadors to send personal emails. Uh, yes, this is a marketing day, uh, a heavy marketing day, but there's also room for your gift officers to be reaching out, getting donors in their portfolio excited about what's going on. Um, it's a great touch point for them to have, but then also you might be soliciting gifts that you may not capture over email or social media for those individuals um, in, in those portfolios. We know portfolio donors tend to be higher level, so they may not be checking their email all day because they're running a corporation or what have you. And so um, if they see their gift officer's e name pop up in their inbox, they may be more likely to click on it rather than Butler University 
um, sending them an email because they may think it's just a generic email. So you need to attack it from both sides and send those personal emails, but then also um, those more general emails. Social media. So social media is day of give. I mean, this is what day of giving revolves around. So um, again, we're going to use those three pillar stories to drive the main content. Um, and, and you'll see here a little bit later in the presentation, I kind of give you a day of schedule. Um, so you'll see where those pillar stories fill in, but then you need to have more than three posts throughout your day. So you need to fill in with live content, um, challenge updates, share your donor posts. You know, if they're tweeting about making a gift and you want to encourage them to share it on social media, reshare that. And so people can see it. And you know, have fun with it. Day of giving is an opportunity to maybe start to color outside the lines a little bit of your social media and your email and um, get really creative with it and um, have fun with it. This um, image here in the top left, this is actually a graphic, an animated graphic of a save the date. Um, I think this was 2018 Butler's Day of Giving. Um, so a little bit more creative, a little more fun, youthful. Um, this graphic right here is from their day of giving this past this past uh, February, which which I didn't work on, but I, I watched pretty closely. Um, and they had an event for the students during um, during the first day. Their day of giving has now become two days, um, and so they just shared pictures from from that event, and um, so people could feel connected to campus and see what's going on. And then this one down here at the bottom is really unique. Um, and I wanted to make sure to share it. Again, this is the, the Catholic high school uh, here in Indianapolis that I worked with. And that gentleman um, is, at the time, was their, um, their president. And he was known for taking walks um, around campus, around the community. He was a walker. That is how he cleared his mind. That is how he stayed fit. Um, and so people were well aware of when he went on his walks. And so at, on the early days of the pandemic, he started to take a selfie stick in his phone and just talk on these walks to the Garen Catholic community. And he would record them of messages of inspiration, um, messages of updates of what were what was going on during the pandemic. Um, and it was really great. People loved it. And so for their day of giving in later April of 2020, we really utilized him to get the message out about their their theme was GC cares. Um, and it was it was very well received. And my point with this is, you don't need to cre recreate the wheel. If there's something already going on in your social media or, or something that's already going on in your organization, figure out how to capture it and use it for day of giving. Um, this was something that he did on his own. And then we just morphed it a little bit for day of giving and asked him on, hey, on this walk, on this day, can you make sure to talk about um, GC Cares and why it's important in the student emergency fund? Um, and he was happy to help. And so I think a lot of people sometimes get caught up on social media of, of what do I post? What, you know, what do I need to do? Um, and a lot of times that content is already there. You may just need to go find it because it's already happening. Um, and so uh, don't be afraid to ask what's, what's already going on uh, out in your organization. Um, my other point is to know your audiences and platforms and to not forget LinkedIn, um, especially um, a, a, a lot of people are on LinkedIn throughout the day who may not be getting on Facebook or Instagram. And so LinkedIn is very important, but um, whoever's managing your social media platforms should really be diving into that data, figuring out um, where your people are, what platform they're on, what posts are they reacting to the most, and the marketing strategist should be able to build um, a strategy from there. I like to provide toolkits for staff, ambassadors, and donors to share graphics um, if they want to put a badge on their social media or, you know, um, something that I gave uh, on this day of giving. That's always great. Um, it's an easy thing to do, um, and it, it gets people excited. I really like paid campaigns for giving days, and, and I think <laughs> a lot of times my clients kind of look at me like I'm crazy when I say this because they're like, 
what do you mean we need to spend money to to do this? Um, and I think social media campaigns just just uh, haven't popped up on their radar yet. But on Facebook and Instagram, especially, we can upload donor lists to target those individuals directly. So um, we can get in on their social media feeds directly, um, which is so nice. Um, and so it, you're not just you're not just advertising to the masses. We're advertising for a very specific group of people. And this is also where segmenting comes in um, of, you know, do you need to target a specific population within, maybe you need to target the um, 20 or 30 year olds, the Gen Z's and the millennials through social media campaigns. Um, and so again, as I said, with your donor database, we're gonna look at that data, figure out the segmenting and, and customize a strategy and tactics around each of those those segments. And then target start start date for social media. I start doing save the dates um, about four weeks out and then I start to increase that frequency. Um, again, this doesn't, I, I, I don't feel like social media falls in the same bucket of email in terms of frequency, just because with algorithms and what content is shown and not shown, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think you can post too much. And so um, I, I don't worry too much if, if we're starting to get annoying, like with the, with the email. So print mail, some of you might be thinking I'm crazy because I included this, but I am definitely in the camp of print mail still is valuable and still has a role in marketing and fundraising strategy. So over here on the right is a day of giving, save the date that I received from Butler, um, probably early February, which is probably about three weeks before their event. And you can see it's a clear envelope and then um, this pennant um, on the inside of it. And one side was the save the day. And then on the other side was just a general go dogs kind of artwork that I could hang up in my office or, or anything like that. And so um, I think if you approach print mail as to be creative um, and really eye catching, I mean, as I was flipping through my mail that day I got it, it definitely popped out in my mind or popped out to my attention. And so there's definitely a place for it. Um, you can also use save the dates within existing mailings. Um, Giving Tuesday, if you have a year of in, in, year in solicitation um, that maybe goes out in early November and you're doing cleanup, you know, throughout November, or December, throw a Giving Tuesday um, badge or a graphic at the, at the bottom of that solicitation, just to remind people of it. Um, there's always the argument of, does it dilute your end of year campaign if you're pushing people to giving Tuesday, but it, I've never experienced that. A lot of times you might get two donations out of that individual. And so, um, uh, I, I, I never hesitate to at least try it once. And then if you need to, segmenting if needed. Um, these, uh, Butler actually, well, when I was there, I don't know about this year, um, they send these mailings uh, to last year's Giving Day donors. Um, and they're very purposeful in making it a very creative, wanted piece um, so that those feel really good about their previous participation. So. Is, the, is print mail a way that you can reward your past donors, um, acknowledge their efforts? Um, and then it also cuts down on costs because you don't feel like you're having to mail to everyone in your database. And then again, a target drop date for this um, is about three to four weeks from the day. We all know that um, there's been some challenges in the postal service with getting things um, not delayed. And so this is always a balance, but um, something to keep in mind. Then events. Um, so I love giving day events. It was um, in 2018, no, 2019, excuse me, at Butler, we decided to add a second day to the giving day and add more events. And the reason that we did that um, is we found we were not going to grow anymore without some, some, additional engagement. We had really hit our max with email engagement, social media engagement, and we needed a way to engage with alumni, donors, 
students, faculty and staff um, beyond just those, those mediums. So events, they build energy and excitement for the day. Um, you can see in that, that image above the students, this is um, the celebration, excuse me, the celebration for um, the 2018 Day of Giving and those are students ringing our victory bell. Um, but you can see in the screen above them, um, we had a count, countdown going um, throughout the entire day. And then we obviously had the amount that had been raised and the number of gifts. Um, so if you remember from the email prior, prior, we had a challenge of, I think it was a thousand gifts unlocks 35,000. So if you create this event and you have this sitting right in front of people that they can't miss, they want to feel a part of that excitement. They want to feel a part of that energy. They don't, it's kind of this, um, internal feeling of, I don't want to be the reason that we don't hit our goal. And so it creates a great sense of competition, um, uh, internally when you're very, very close to goal. Um, and it doesn't have to be heavily programmed. You know, it could just be a gathering. Um, when I was at the Boy Scouts for Brackets for Good, the each round ended on Friday evenings at 7 p.m. Or, or what have you. Um, and we would all gather at a local restaurant, the staff would, and then some select donors um, and have some drinks and some appetizers. And we'd watch the, the results come in and we'd be calling donors and calling volunteers that we knew um, saying, we're so close to beating XYZ nonprofit. Can you please make a gift? Um, and so it doesn't have to be a, a huge undertaking. It can be very casual. I think sometimes that a more casual event actually works better because um, people don't feel like they have to be on at these events um, and feel heavily programmed. They can just relax a little bit and enjoy your organization and your staff and what have you. Um, the other thing is this is an opportunity to engage with donors who may not have the time or want to make an online gift. So again, maybe those higher level donors um, they don't have time throughout the day to make a gift. They don't want to make an online gift for whatever reason. Invite them to this event. Um, you can have laptops available for people to make gifts on site if they'd like. Um, of course, you always want to have a mobile option that people can do it on their phone, but um, it may be that they want to make a gift, you know, as the staff member is helping them through it. So just removing those barriers during the events, having laptops available really helps. Um, and then the other thing that you can also do is tie the day into an existing event. Um, at Butler, we tied it into, we, we scheduled sometimes on basketball game days um, to get the energy from, from game days. And, and we would make sure that um, the field house would have signage and stuff like that about the, about the day. Um, one year, I know they had alumni events um, in satellite cities. So like they had the St. Louis alumni event where um, the university leadership goes down there and um, meets with St. Louis um, Butler alumni. And so they made that event on day of giving and it helps people feel connected to the day who may not necessarily be connected otherwise. So um, always good options there. So here's a day of schedule that um, I follow. Granted, there's a lot of detail uh, in between all these lines, but this kind of gives you an idea of, of how to roll out your communication. So 6 a.m., we're sending that email and the first story, and we're doing a social media post. Um, I like that 6 a.m. because you're catching people as they're opening up their email while they're laying in bed trying to wake up or scrolling through Facebook or Instagram or you know their social media platform of choice. And so you're really catching people um, early on in that day. The other reason I like it is if that social media post gets caught up in an algorithm and, and they do not see it in that 6 a.m. hour, you still have all, all morning to, um, to, for that to show up in their, their feed. So 6 a.m. to 12 p.m., social media posts. This is when you're doing your lives. This is when you're doing your challenges. If you meet a challenge in the morning, you're posting about it. Um, 12 p.m., that noontime hour, 11.30, 12 p.m., that's when your second email goes out, your social media posts. You're updating people on where the challenges are. You're encouraging them to give the, to those challenges. That 12 p.m., 
hour is when they're sitting on their phone at lunch or at least taking some sort of break throughout the day. So it's great to great to hit them then. And then 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. These are these are more social media posts. And without a doubt, this is always going to be your slowest time of day for gifts. And so you really need to make sure that you have some type of plan for that time. Um, people are back at work. Um, they're not focused in on stuff. They are, you know, rush hour home, picking kids up from daycare, starting the evening routine, you know, going to the gym, what have you. And this is going to be your slowest time. So, you know, plan some social media lives that's going to show up at the top of their feed. Um, are there special challenges that you could do? You know, a 2 p.m. challenge that unlocks whatever amount. So get creative during this time and just know that um, if gifts start to slow down during this time, it's not a panic moment. It happens. Um, and then 6 p.m., is your third story um, over email and your social media posts. Again, you're updating about your challenges, telling people where you are to go. Um, and then 9 p.m. is that final push of we really need to get there. Um, I haven't had a giving day yet in, in all the giving days that I've done that that 9 p.m. Po that 9 p.m. email is the thank you email that we've wrapped up and we've hit goal. You really need that 9 p.m. email to get you over the finish line. Um, so, so day of management, we call it the war room, um, uh, and giving days are not schedule posts, schedule email and walk away and do your, your daily work on this day. I mean, you have to monitor, 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 um, you need to adjust email and social content as needed. Like I said, you want to be updating in those emails and those social media posts, um, to the minute of this is where we are to goal and we need your help to get to goal. You can also use that time to activate gift officers to make personal phone calls or emails if gifts are lag lagging. Um, and so you, you've really got to keep on, on it. Um, live updates on social media creates a sense of urgency and excitement with donors. Um, when I was at the Boy Scouts, Facebook Live was not a thing yet, but I would really quick on my phone, um, do a quick video with our um, council executive director of, hey, we need your help. We're really excited. We're really close. We want to get to the next round. Um, please make a gift. Um, and so you, you've got to have access to that person and they're not, you know, have a full day of meetings or something like that. You can obviously reshare your audience posts and I mentioned that throughout the day. Um, and it, it really creates an energetic atmosphere in your office. People are excited about it. Um, and I say that with a caveat of not everyone should be in the war room. Um, you can get too many people in there and it turns more into a party rather than a working session. So uh, this is a stock photo, but this is a pretty good example of what a, a giving day war room <laughs> looks like for lack of a better term. Um, we would have a TV screen at the end of the table and on one side we would watch uh, a social media feed. And then on the other side, we were watching gifts come in. And so we knew to the second what was coming in and what was happening. Um, and in that room, we had our fundraising strategist um, at Butler that was the annual giving um, individual when I was with the Boy Scouts that was um, just the development officer. Um, we had the marketing strategist, which was obviously me at that time, um, who's kind of overlooking the entire marketing strategy. We had the social media manager sitting in there right with us. Um, so he, he or she could be making those changes. And then we actually had a graphic designer with us during that time so that um, he, at Butler, he could be making graphics as we needed them. So if we got to a point that we um, were, gifts were really slow or something was happening, he'd whip up an animated graphic real quick and we could post it on social media. And we kind of had him on reserve for the entire day. So we weren't disrupting um, his normal work day, if he was sitting at his office all, or sitting at his desk all day, um, he was prepared to make day of giving. He had easy access to his files um, and he was able to crank out as needed graphics. He had created a bank of graphics that we had access to, but it was also nice that as things happened and we needed to react to them, 
he was able to make those really quick for us. Don't forget the thank you uh, and share your results. I am guilty of this myself. Um, you get so excited and so into the giving day and the planning of the actual day, you forget the thank you and you forget about sharing your results and you go into work the next day and you're so tired from the day before, you can't even think about the thank you. So please learn from my lessons um, of plan your thank you before the day. Get a video with your executive director or whoever um, before thanking the donors and then put the results of your day in the body of the email or the body of the social media post. Um, you will save yourself a lot of headache um, if, if you have that done and it is just sitting in a folder for you the day after um, the giving day. And then real quick, my last point um, is just a note about Giving Tuesday. Um, Giving Tuesday swirls around my head quite a bit when it comes to Giving Days. Um, it's actually, it will have its 10th anniversary here this November. Um, last year alone, it raised $2.7 billion, um, which is unbelievable when you think what's happened in the past 10 years. Um, I was looking for the 2012, um, amount raised and I couldn't find it. In 2013, Blackbaud um, reported around 10 million went through their um, giving platform. And so, I mean, you just think of the impact that Giving Tuesday has had. Um, I think it still has a place in your fundraising ca calendar, but I say that with keep in mind, it's becoming increasingly difficult to cut through the Giving Tuesday clutter. Everyone is asking for something on Giving Tuesday and you will have, your donors have an inbox full of requests for Giving Tuesday gifts and their social media platforms are full of Giving Tuesday requests. And that doesn't matter if you have a really engaged donor pool and they love your organization and are ready to give. But if you don't, you're, you might get stuck in the chaos. So one thing that um, we've been trying a little bit is to consider give, get, Giving Tuesday as a stewardship or brand awareness initiative. So just thank your donors. Really, really get into the gratitude feeling of we're just going to thank our donors, um, which is a great brand awareness initiative and, and really can elevate your brand and then use a separate day of giving to really drive gifts. Um, I think in the past day, day of giving was driven for higher education and education inst institutions. And I'm seeing nonprofits all over the place um, have their own giving days. And so I think donors are accustomed to se separate giving days. And so I think that lessens the barrier, or even decreases the barrier overall that your donors would be surprised that you're you're hosting your own giving day. So um, I'm just gonna turn it over to questions. And I'll put real here while we're talking here um, is my information to connect my, my email address. Feel free to contact me um, over email and my website. And then of course on LinkedIn. And then I just have a, a shameless plug for a new um, product that I'm offering, um, but I, I definitely want to get to those questions. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. Uh, really do appreciate it. I have a ton of questions too, but mine <laughs> follow everybody else's. So if you have a question or a comment at this point, I'm, I'm, we're going to turn our attention from the chat. Thank you for using that earlier to the Q&A. So please do post anything you have right there. We really appreciate you. And let's just take them in sequence, if you don't mind, because I think that the ones that came in earlier probably referred back to some of the things you addressed uh, earlier in the presentation. And one came in from Heather, who had asked, uh, what if you're a small team? And, and I know we both hear this question a lot about a lot of things, but particularly with what you've been talking about. How do you manage when you're a one-person shop? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is hard. I've been, I've been fortunate that I've been in organizations that have these major teams. Um, but I think 
volunteers are so are, are so great for giving days because it is a short-term initiative that they can really get behind and if you're creating the plan they can implement it out and so I think finding volunteers and you know create a giving day committee um, that really gets people excited about it um, similar in the fact that it's you know you can get quick gifts and younger donors love that I think they also like that from a volunteer standpoint they want a short-term commitment they don't they don't want to sign on from a volunteer role for the next five years, 10 years of their life. So um, I utilize volunteers. Um, I mean, at the Boy Scouts, they are a volunteer run organization. And so we used um, volunteers quite a bit. Right. It probably makes the war room a little bit easier and smaller. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> we, had a, we had a comment from uh, Tracy um, asking about the slide deck. And this is a good thing to note now before we get into some other substantive questions. First of all, there's a recording of this that's being made, and that will be placed in the library of content that is held by Donor Search over at YouTube. So if you've missed any sessions in the past or want to see sessions in the future, you can't make one of these to have, be a part of the discussion check out donor searches youtube channel where you'll see this content along with uh many many other sessions uh come but if people want to have a copy of your slide deck is that something you'd be willing to share yeah absolutely yeah reach out to me um over email uh, there on the slide and i'd be happy to send it to you and, and answer any questions and just as a note uh because most of us in this world of fundraising attend webinars and <laughs> we don't necessarily know what happens in the background I can tell you that the people who registered, we we unless you tell us we have permission, we're not sharing this list with Emily. So the only way that right. Emily can talk with you is for you to reach out to Emily, which is why her information is right there. <laughs> so do take it down off the screen or grab it off of YouTube because you can tell mm -hmm. she's very generous with her time and her insight. Mm -hmm. um, back to the questions. We had one earlier about, do you have any advice on scheduling posts and emails for a two-day uh, kind of giving um, uh allotment uh specifically a give big give big i've not heard of that yeah <laughs> I, it, it's not so, and maybe she can give us more clues as to what she means because a lot of these uh, the regional ones mm -hmm. um they might be a one day they might be mm -hmm. something that occurs over several days but do you have thoughts about working at a schedule so it does you know maybe stretch a little bit yeah so <sighs> I think two day giving days are, are great. Um, I really like them just because you're not gonna gather everyone in that first day. You're, you're gonna miss people. And then, you know, they, they happen on the next day and they're like, oh, I missed it. Uh, but as far as scheduling posts and scheduling emails, besides that 6 a.m. kickoff email um, on either day, cause you can schedule the day twos kickoff email, you know, the night before. Um, I like to keep it not scheduled because um, you don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and you you want to be updating your donors on where the challenges are at, whether you have just an overall goal of, you know, a thousand gifts unlocks $25,000. And, and we need to say, you know, we're at 600 gifts as of 12 p.m. or, or what have you. Um, so I tend to shy away from scheduling just because I think, I think the authenticity of not scheduling comes through mm. um, on on giving days. I mean, people know that content is scheduled. I mean, that's a very common thing. But I think when you're interacting with your audiences on social, on email, you're you're updating in real time. That generates a lot of energy and excitement around the day. Maybe maybe that's one of those key words. And I know you've talked about it earlier is maintaining that energy. So whether it's one day or two days, or maybe like the AFP conference, many of us will be going to, hopefully we'll see some of you there. I'll be there in Las Vegas, <laughs> hope to see you. Um, that uh, it's probably also a matter of not just having content, but knowing how to kind of interact with the audience mm -hmm. throughout a period of time. And that's changing. Is that why you were talking about how everybody's kind of sitting in the room, whether it's one person or 15 people trying to monitor the activity, because you probably have to decide, well, we'll post one more thing or hold back or will interact with someone? Is it more dynamic than just, here's the schedule? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're, you're spot on. Um, we, it, you have your players in the room and you're talking about, okay, what should we post here? Do we want to go ahead and say that we've reached 500 gifts or should we let it stretch? If, if we are on an, an hour, we're, we're really talking an hour to hour uh, segments. You know, if we have an hour that we, gifts are just flying in and they're just coming in, you know, what do we want to post to keep that energy up? Or 
do we want to say that we're at this goal? Um, and it might, you know, kill the energy for the day. And so, yeah, you're exactly right. The, that group of people in that war room, we are talking all the time about what's going on um, and how we can either capitalize on donors are just flooding us or do we need to start generating more buzz about this? Right. And, and this kind of builds on that question of why this is from Heather, who was asking about the best way to participate in community giving days, because those are occurring everywhere. And well, I give in Tuesday, I guess, mm -hmm. is effectively that. And you talked about that competition. I love that with others, um, you know, in the area that Butler mm -hmm. was competing with. So how how do you um, how do you approach that where you want to be a part of the action, but you don't want necessarily the action to detract from your institutional uh, needs and objectives? Yeah, Giving Tuesday is a com. It has become so complex over the past few years because it's it's become so big, right. um, and I can't say I have one answer. It really depends on the organization um, and what your donors expect from you on Giving Tuesday. You know, some donors expect. I want to be able to make a gift to my organization on Giving Tuesday. And so you need to be available to do that. Um, whereas if you have a really engaged donor base that is really engaged in your separate giving day, they may appreciate more of a gratitude of, hey, you're not asking me for money again. I already gave to you on your giving day. Um, and so a moment of gratitude is really great. And so I think it's hard to say, this is what my recommendation is for everyone. It's, it's really testing the temperature of your donor pool and, and going from there and getting feedback from your gift officers of what are donors talking about right now um, and trying to figure that out. You know, I, I do wanna just zero in on that thing about the, the thank yous and the gratitude for a minute because there's so much debate in our field about how much energy to put into that versus just going out there and trying to get some money. And um, the two, you talked about how symbiotic they are, planning in advance to be able to thank people the next day that you may be exhausted, but they still need to know. And that's so important. They're, they're increasing, increasingly, we're finding um, that people are using tools like video thanks mm -hmm. in order mm -hmm. to facilitate that. And they might even be very personalized, you know, thanking yeah. either individual donors or thanking donors to, let's say, a school within a university. Mm -hmm. Or it's a thank you from the president who's carrying the, you know, taking the walk with the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the selfie stick or whatever. So what are your thoughts on using some of those techniques to uh, make, make gratitude really a part and fabric of the whole enterprise of a giving day? Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. When I was at Butler, they just started to implement a program and the name of it is escaping me right now for some reason thank you is coming to mind. And it oh, was yeah, a platform you. You. Um, that you could customize the thank you video. Um, and we had a hard time implementing it and really trying to figure it out from an internal process standpoint. But the idea is there. The idea is great of, you know, sending a personalized thank you. Um, and if you can do that, I... Sometimes people say, oh, we need to send that to our high level donors. Well, could you just say, let's send it to our new donors and they get a personalized video of a thank you from a student or a member of your organization or a volunteer and they get that personalized video. And so, and then everyone else may just get a generic video. Um, and so when it comes to that kind of thing of creating more of a customized experience for your donors, I think it's okay to segment it out of, you know, this group of new donors, we, we really want to focus on them and retain them. Um, so let's put some more energy in there and send them customized videos. Not that the rest of the donors aren't important, but uh, knowing we can't be everything to everyone. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned segmentation for, for so many reasons, but one of which is that um, all this whole series is sponsored by Donor Search, and they don't it, we don't talk about their services here much, but I just have to mention one thing, which is whether it's donor search or another company, mm -hmm. one way of figuring out what to do next, or maybe what to do in advance is to know something about your donors, which is always a challenge. So when you've worked, um, and you don't have to mention company names, I, I, but when you've uh, worked on giving days, what part has research played either in the planning um, and segmentation of the work you do, either with uh, ambassadors like social ambassadors or mm -hmm. donors, um, 
uh, or afterwards. So after the new donors come in, first thank them, like you said, but then mm -hmm. know something about these folks because it's quite possible there's a $25 donor who could give $25,000 if we right. just knew something about them. So what right. role does research play? You know, from a marketing standpoint, I don't think I've ever explored that. That I, I'm kind of moving on to the next marketing strategy. I mean, I know when I was at Butler, obviously, higher education advancement departments are machines. Um, you know, all that information was being pushed to the research department to figure out, you know, where where are uh, the hidden gems, if you will. Um, and then, I mean, when I was at the Boy Scouts with Brackets for Good, our we had a development staff of two, I believe at the time. And yeah. so they were looking through that data um, to see if there was any new names popping up, especially um, for board cultivation opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a volunteer that we might, are, we're might starting to see we want to get them on a committee. We want to get them on the board. If they're giving a lot, what's their giving history? Right. Um, and so, so they were looking through that data. And, and I think that's important to note that looking through that data, not only for uh, future giving, but then also what could they do on a board level, on a volunteer level? Um, you know, maybe they could be on a giving day steering committee or something like that. And so um, I know that's something that the fundraisers that I've worked with have really uh, dove into. Well, the fact that you brought marketing and fundraising together <laughs> <laughs> in each of these settings, whether it's two people or a whole, you know, big uh, <laughs> army of people is so wonderful. I mean, it, it, does, <laughs> it doesn't mean that that's possible, right? Because you got to keep your focus where your focus is, but then somebody else might do something that that you or your team doesn't have the bandwidth to do. So that's, that's right. and research is just one example of that. Exactly. Um, we, we did have this question from Phil who said, who asked, are there any tips for getting team members to rethink the approach to a giving day? If they've been doing the same thing for five plus years, there are a lot of question marks after his question, which shows a certain degree of, you know, desire mm -hmm. for change. How do you get them in the change or enhancement mindset? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to make the assumption that there's probably an existing giving day happening and they probably hit the ceiling with it and need to, to revamp it a little bit, which um, in 20. 19, we were there at Butler. Um, I remember myself and my annual giving counterpart, annual giving was responsible for day of giving. Um, we, the summer before we're sitting there thinking, all right, how are we going to raise more dollars? We've been given this new goal. How are we going to do it? And, and that's when we brought in events um, and uh, trying to build energy there. And so I think I think understanding, you know, we've hit our max capacity for what we're going to do with gifts, like having a real conversation of, we know we're not going to grow at this point. Like we, we've maxed out what we can. So we need to bring something else in something more flashy in, um, because I mean, donors get exhausted. Donor fatigue is real. And it's like, oh, well, okay. It's February day of giving is going to happen again, or it's April. Here comes day of giving again. Um, I think donors check out. And so um, I think talking about donor fatigue, talking about have we hit that giving ceiling um, are very real things that are serious conversations that need to happen because at some point you're just spinning your wheels. Um, and it's, you're, you, like you said, you're just going through the paces and it's like, why are we spending time, energy, resources um, to do this? I mean, day of giving is a lot of work. There was a time, at Butler that we were raising more dollars on Giving Tuesday than we were on Day of Giving. And we were spending 10 times the energy on Day of Giving. And so I think it's just having a really honest conversation of, of what's, what's reality. Uh, you know, I, I know that we're already past the hour mark, but there are so many questions that I have for <laughs> others have. So maybe we need to revisit this again. There are giving days throughout the year. It's not just one day a year for, mm -hmm you know, somebody's alma mater or your community or Giving Tuesday, this is something where we have a chance to welcome new people into the fold, to give people something to do as volunteers, to really mm -hmm. participate as, as in brand ambassadors um, and all these other things that uh, rarely do we get everybody collaborating within our offices to achieve. So 
I'm, I'm really grateful, Emily, that you took the time to share some of this experience with us. I want to encourage everybody to go ahead and if they haven't already, uh, maybe just, you know, uh, grab your, your website address or look you up on LinkedIn um, and uh, take a look at that. Of course, you can get a copy of the slide deck directly from her because she doesn't have this list. So unless you tell her you're interested, <laughs> she, she can't contact you. Um, but also a, a copy of this will be once again over on YouTube in the next couple of days. That's at the Donor Search channel on YouTube and under the Mastermind series. So you'll find lots of content there. We've done over 500 of these programs. We're gradually moving all that past content over there. But uh, this one, I think, will be especially helpful and meaningful this year because <laughs> this is such an important component of making sure, once again, we can give everybody a chance to uh, support the work we do at our institution. So um, again, thank you very much, Emily. Thank you to all of you for hanging out with us today a little bit over the hour. Um, and I hope you'll join us for the next sessions in the series. You can learn more about that over at the donorsearch.net uh, website. They have content about all the webinars, podcasts, and webcasts we do. And you can, of course, if you're interested in knowing anything about any of those individual sessions, always reach out to me individually. It's just my name, Jay, J-A-Y, at donorsearch.net. Be happy to share anything I know. Uh, or to uh, you know take your comments and suggestions as we build content for the future. There are 90 of these programs this year. It's built around your needs and interests. Tell us what you want, and that's what you'll see. But until then, just stay healthy out there, everybody, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.